Michael Bay went out of his mind. He was like, you can't do that, you know, because I would do all kinds of crazy things. I said, I said, without this toy, I said, there's no movie. I said, there's no Michael Bay. I said, you would be known for Pearl Harbor. I said, but this is, this is what it's about. Do the right thing. Pino, get a broom and sweep up front. Mm. Pino, get a broom and sweep out front. Huh? Get a broom and sweep out front. What? Get a broom and sweep out front! I grew up uh, in Hollis, Queens, which was predominantly a black neighborhood. And I moved to kind of a more of a white neighborhood. Then I got bussed out to a all black junior high school later on. So a lot of the, the film spoke to me, and, and I remember I liked the script a lot. When I met Spike, he was very quiet, and uh, he said, you know, what part do you like? And I said, I, 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 said, I, I think because of the subject matter of it, I, I'd rather play, uh, you know, the racist part, because that's, you know, I, I know where some of those people are coming from, you know, having grown up in a black community, then going to a white community, and, and kind of feeling some of that prejudice, even, you know, even towards me. Pop, I don't believe this shit. You run welfare or something? Every day you give this Azu Pep a dollar. What's Azu Pep? Where's this Azu Pep Are shit? You the, me, the, man no Azu Pep? the man ain't no Azu Pep. Every day you give this Azu Pep a dollar for sweeping on sidewalk. So when you would watch me say these things over and over again, sometimes people would think, well, that's, that's who he really is. And there was a girl who was on craft services and she, uh, she used to pass me by with the water. And one day I said, may I have a glass of water? And she turned and she told me, she said, I, you know, I hate you. She said, you know, I hate you so much. Mookie is not to be trusted. I trust him, too. No, 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 no way down can be trusted. The first time you turn your back, boom, ah! A spear right here, man, in the back. And Spike was just very collaborative. You know, me and Richard fighting in wrestling. That was something that we, we came up with on, you know, on the day, you know. Uh, to have a contradiction, you know, physical contradiction, and you're trying to kill your brother, and you're saying, you know, I love you, listen to me, you know what I mean? But there was a lot of uh, laughter and fun and all kinds of stuff in that, until we got to the end of the movie, which was not so much fun to do. Put the fucking bat down! Come on, I'm right, you never get your Shut up with the motherfucker! You what? Not the fucker! You But it was a lot of energy on that set. It had a, it's a different kind of vitality to it because people hadn't gotten to tell a lot of their stories. And we, it was very exciting to do something that was about something. I did think there was something palpable about it. That's all I, that's all I knew. When I saw the first screening, I was like, holy moly, I was... And then, you know, when the film came out, there, a lot of people thought there were gonna be uh, riots in the theater and people, you know, be violence, and uh, it was just the opposite. None of that ever happened. But it, it kind of cemented my friendship with Spike. He grew up in an Italian neighborhood. I grew up in a black neighborhood. He saw that I would try to create a whole human being who was that way, and not just, you know, uh, a flat cardboard cutout, a uh, representation of that. The Big Lebowski. I had no idea the movie would be as funny as it was, and I even didn't even get the movie when I saw it the first time. I was like, some of it went over my head. It wasn't until later on that I realized how it's a religious film. It's a sort of a existential philosophy. Coen said that he was inspired in part by, they saw even a play? Yeah. What was the story the, behind the play it? Was, the play was called La Puta Vida by Ronaldo Pravad, and I played a character that was called Chino, and it was very close, you know, like a cousin. And that's why when I did the movie later on, sort of a sequel uh, of the Jesus, I was really thinking about that particular play. So I, I loved that character when I did it on stage. I liked when I did the sequel. And so when it was a little part, and I said, wow, what am I gonna do with this? And they said, well, you'll come up with some stuff and we're gonna give you some extra time. And they did. So, you know, when you, you're on for a little short time, you have to like, 
really make it count. You pull any of your crazy shit with us, you flash a piece out on the lanes, I'll take it away from you and stick it up your ass and pull the fucking trigger till it goes click. Jesus. You said it, man. Nobody fucks with the Jesus. So, uh, but I didn't realize they would put it together that way. When I saw it, I was embarrassed the first time, I have to say. But it's the character that I love. Yeah, I, I could just, I mean, I could have a talk show as the Jesus. Could have all different people on, like Tom Brady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's happening, Tom, man? Why'd you retire and shit, you know? I wanna know, I wanna know what's going on, man. You know? I could have been way better quarterback than you, man. Yeah, because I had the finger man. <laughs> Arden Fink. Did you... Somebody just complained. No, I didn't. I mean, I, I did call down. Not to complain exactly. Really fun, fun, fun shoot. I got to work with so many great actors. John Goodman, Tony Shalhoub, Michael Lerner, John Polito. I spent a lot of time in prep with Joel and Ethan rehearsing with them, reading with them, talking about it. Well, I don't mean to get up on my high horse, but why shouldn't we look at ourselves up there? Who cares about the fifth Earl of Bastrop and Lady Higginbottom and, and who killed Nigel Grinch Gibbons? I could feel my butt getting sore already. It was challenging and it was a, a, a lot of uh, fun to, you know, attempt. You know, I was writing stuff while they were filming me. Again, because I was watching films about writers and I, they never looked like they were writing anything. And we didn't, they didn't know exactly how everything would play too. They, they, I said one day, they said, oh, you're making it much more horribly human than we imagined. And I was like, well, that's kind of my job, I think. I am a creator. Miller's Crossing. They said they were writing this part for me for a couple of years and it took them a long time. And in the middle, they wrote Barton Fink when they had writer's block. <laughs> I get, it, get, it, get to the point, huh? Okay. The point is, I'm a good guy. I've heard up from a lot of people today. Good guy, lots of friends. That's the way it works. Maybe if you appreciated me a little more, you wouldn't be making ways with Leo. You know, when someone gives you that much, then your feeling is, well, I want to surprise them and do something even more than maybe they imagined. And that's how I've always felt working for, with Joel and Ethan. And two of the nicest people, uh, most uh, humane people, you know, I've, I've ever worked with. And so I would, what I would do for them, I wouldn't necessarily be able to do for other directors. Look at you, Lord. Look at you, Lord. You can't come in. Look at you, Lord. I had a picture of Leopold and Loeb, and I said, this is how I want to look. I, I interviewed a lot of people. I had them do the lines for me in Yiddish and in English. So yeah, I really put a lot of uh, work into it, and they gave me uh, plenty of freedom in how I attacked it, but because it was so specific, the look and everything, I, I felt very, very free. Scratch, huh? <laughs> a little bonus. What did it make to take Rogue's hair? That beats me the kid was dizzy. 50-50 on the dough, or, or maybe I should get a little more since I did the deed. I think when you know someone has written something for you or whatever, you just feel like, wow, they believe in me, and it's unsaid. The things in relationships that are really deep are, are not said. They're not given words. It's like if you really love someone, can't keep saying to them, hey, I love you. It's what you do. Quiz show. I was with Redford a long time in prep, so I had all this footage. I met the real Herb. I gained a lot of weight, which made me sick later uh, on. But I had a wonderful time working with Robert Redford. He was a terrific uh, director, and we really got along really well. And he's from the theater, and we, we spoke the same uh, language. Well, it's a damnest thing, but you plateaued. Plateaued? What, what kind of word is that? 
Well, plateaued? Plateaued. Plateaued? Uh, it's, well, it's like uh, you... You mean like people you... don't like me anymore? I did gain a lot of weight, and I, my teeth were discolored, my hair was thinned, and someone came on the set one day and told Redford, like, wow, John looks very different. And I like, kind of like let himself go a little bit. He just loved that. You know, he thought that was the greatest thing ever. And Redford really got a kick out of what I was, you know, doing. And the whole crew used to do my warm up because I used to try to get my voice very high. Well, uh, for example, he uh, told me how to breathe heavily into the microphone and sigh, uh, such as this. Uh, <sighs> <sighs> He told me how to stutter and say in a plaintive voice, I will take uh, nine, uh, nine points. I used to have to go, you know, mm -hmm. the whole crew used to do this whole thing, but I would do the whole mask warm up to get my voice, which is not normally that high, you know, to, uh, but uh, Herb had this particular kind of voice. You know, you, you take what you can from the person, then you have to make them your own. But Herb was so unique. And there was so much great stuff to mine. And, you know, that's part of the fun of it. Oh, brother, where art thou? Crazy movie and... You know, I was learning to play the mandolin, and they told me I'm not going to do the mandolin, and this and that, and you know, I had to learn an accent, and then I, and then I had to get fake teeth, and had my head shaved, and I had a, I had a ball doing it. And uh, once again, the film did pretty well because of the album, but people were like obs obsessed with it. They would watch it again and again. It's such a funny movie. I've always wondered, what's the devil look like? Well, of course, there are all manner of lesser imps and demons, Pete, but the great Satan himself is red and scaly with a bifurcated tail. He carries a hay fork. When you work with those guys, they know what they're doing, they know what they want. Every little thing counts. You know, sometimes we wouldn't know what to do in the scene, and Ethan would tell me to, to show my... I had all these rotten teeth, this, you know, lower teeth, and he would just say, show your teeth. You know, get that, that kind of teeth like that, you know. And I, I walked around all day like I talked like that the entire day. I would try it out on people. I would talk to people a lot, you know, and uh, they would talk back to me. And I was thinking, all right, well, they believe it, so, uh, you know. Uh, you stole from my kin. Who was fixing to betray us. You didn't know that at the time. So I borrowed it till I did know. That don't make no sense. I mean, some things are like so cartoony, it's different, but some things are, are larger than life. But there are people in life that are larger than life. Not everyone, you know, talks like that in a movie. And that's one of the things that sometimes gets me, because I can't understand what they're saying. You know what I mean? A lot of young, I, I can't understand, I can't hear them. Now, maybe I'm getting old, I'm getting deaf, but I'd like to be able to hear what the fuck you're saying. But sometimes in a movie like that, if you were being very ultra-naturalistic, it would not register. I've also done a lot of theater, so it's not a big deal for me to say, okay, go from here to here, but should I go to there, you know, within it. But it depends where the camera is. Stage, you learn how to sustain a whole entire performance. And you are the editor, because you know when people are falling asleep, and you have to shift gears constantly. So you're like a more of a Maserati, you know, where you're a piecemeal worker in a film. You're doing it. You, you, you're, you're moment hunting. Transformers. I was offered a lot of big budget movies, a lot of them, and I turned them all down. I used to do medium, small plays. Sometimes I, on the advice of my kids, too, uh, I, I would give them the script. They would say, this, no, it's not good. They said, don't even read it, just do it. And so I did. Big guys, big guys with big guns. What is Sector 7? Answer me. I'm the one who asks questions around here. Not you, young man! How'd you know about the aliens? Where did you take my parents? I am not at liberty to dis no? discuss it. Hey. I had a lot of fun working with Michael Bay. I think Michael's really, I think, kind of aped his energy. You know, it was, it was exhausting because it's not like the most nuanced work. It's sort of like a, a bold action painting or a sketch, you know? But within that, 
I did enjoy his, uh, you know, his energy, and and I liked working with Jire. Anyway, Mr. NBE One here, aka Megatron, that's what they call him. He's pretty much the harbinger of death. Wants to use the cube to transform human technology to take over the universe. I mean, I used to laugh because you know there was nothing to look at. You know, like with a microphone, you would go, oh "My God, it's, you know, you know, uh, it's Prime, it's uh, it's uh, Optimus Prime, my God, you know." And they would they would let me improvise all the time, and I was like, "Well, don't you guys get a lot of money to write these kind of scripts?" Timor Simmons. Bill, big fan. Great to be here. Now, Agent Simmons, you would have us believe that it is in our best interest to formally take sides in this so-called alien civil war? Well, the other side wanted to spank us for breakfast, so I wouldn't exactly call it a toss-up. I had all the stunt men get me all the original toys, which I knew about, you know. So I took it out in, in a shot, and I said, they said it was a toy, you know. And I said, but then I transformed it, you know, into the truck. I said, but now we know it's bad. You know, it's not. It's real. And Michael Bay went out of his mind. He was like, you can't do that. You know, because I would do all kinds of crazy things. I said, well, I said, without this toy, I said, there's no movie. I said, there's no Michael Bay. I said, you, you know, for Pearl Harbor. I said, but this is this is what it's about. I think that kind of uh, uh, spirit is essential when you do something like that. You have to be like a five-year-old in a way when they play. You know, five euros, they're serious. Night of. I mean, those are two of the best writers, you know, Richard Price and Steve Zalian. And I had a lot of time to prepare. I met a lot of lawyers and courts. And there's a lawyer, Kenny Montgomery, who was very, very helpful to me. The material was rich, and I felt like uh, my connection to Riz was very organic. Your man is here, as it were. Johnny the Red. Bye now. And don't lose that key. 25 years, the Berlin Wall comes down. And this throwback's still going on about communists. So. And I know Bill Camp, you know, Jeannie Berlin, I thought. I thought Steve's casting with Avery Kaufman was great. It was about something th that is a big problem. You know, I mean, Rikers Island is a bigger problem now than it was then. And what happens, you know, to people when they enter that system? You know, any system, uh, you see the pros and cons of it and the nuances of it and the little deaths that happen within it. And so just a great character, you know, it's a great, it was a great character, too. Great character. Yeah, I brought you some clothes. You can collect them after. Did your folks put some money in your account? Uh, no, I don't think they knew to. Well, I'll make a deposit for you. You need money in here. How you doing? I'm okay. And I wanted to do another, even a different case with it, but we've never been able to agree, not me, they have, you know, on like what that case would be or whatever, but I loved working on it. I really did. It was one of those, you know, experiences that you just felt like it's all there. You know, I had enough time to know it backwards and forwards. The Batman. I love, you know, film noir and all that stuff, but, you know, those kind of people who last, whether they're politicians, whether they're businessmen, whether they're gangsters who become businessmen, you know, they're the, the person who's like, lives in the subterranean world, you know, and they uh, are the person behind the screen who pulls all the strings and also, figures out people's vulnerabilities. And once they find that vulnerability and once that person needs help, they come in as this altruistic person, this benefactor, and then all of a sudden you're in their debt and they own you. And Matt wanted it very grounded and everything. And uh, so that's what I was sort of attempting. And you know, I've been around enough people growing up. My dad was in the building line and I saw some of these people up close. And, uh, you know, there was something that was really, my father used to say, don't look in this one particular person's eyes. He said, don't look in his eyes. If he talks to you, just look away. Because there was something kind of dead and seductive at the same time. So I thought, you know, that could be something you know, interesting. I mean, I'm a Batman fan. I've been a Batman fan since I've been a kid. and. Amadeo, my oldest, works for DC Comics and resident Batman expert. So and Matt was just very, 
you know, collaborative. And I liked working very much with uh, Robert and with Zoe, very much. Is there a specific kind of logic or philosophy that you have when choosing roles? I mean, looking for things that, you know, that you haven't done. You know, you're looking to not do something that you think you could do. 